In the book of 1 John, written by the Apostle John later on in his life, certainly one of the last letters that we have from him, we heard about John and some of the historical records of him as he got older into his later years. He used to be brought up onto stage by the disciples and sat on the stage and he would tell them three words, four words, love one another love one another and then he would pick him up and he would leave this is John who was the disciple of love but didn't start out as the disciple of love he was the disciple who was one of the brothers of thunder if you remember he and James were related to one another and they were brothers they were fishing in the Sea of Galilee when Jesus called them he called them bow energies which is the sons of thunder because Jesus went to send them into a town to prepare for his arrival and the people in town didn't want anything to do with Jesus. And they came back and they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? And Jesus said, you do not know what spirit you are of. And so they got this nickname and uh, a couple of hotheads. So this is John who was a hothead. He was the youngest of the disciples, certainly very young, probably in his teenage years. And this later in his life, he's the only disciple that actually remains on and dies of natural causes uh, that we're aware of. You can go see, if you go to the Holy Land, you can see where he was buried. And he was the uh, head of the Ephesus church at the time. So we've been going through the book of 1 John and looking at his message. We're going to begin with chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son jesus christ and these things we write to you that your joy may be full this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So as we consider the word today, we're going to take this from John as a first-person eyewitness report of the teachings of Jesus and what he tells us as Christians. What does a Christian look like? Not somebody just in name only, but somebody who truly has fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And he goes down and he begins to create this list because there were folks in the church that had gone off, claimed to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and their Lord, and yet their behavior was completely other. And so the question is, what do you do with someone who proclaims these things by word and yet their lives don't align? And so John begins to tell us what a real Christian looks like, what comes out of a person who's been born again, not just what they say, but how they behave. So we pick it up in 1 John. You have to know that this was written around 90 AD. He has some familiar terms, which he adds all the time and says, this is the same John who was fishing with his brother. And Peter and Andrew and James and, and John, they end up getting taken in by Jesus as disciples. So John was there. He was there when there was the feeding of the 5,000 with the few loaves and the few fish that Jesus took, and he split among all of them far more than 5,000. There were 5,000 men, and they all ate until they were full, and they each went and collected 12 baskets full of leftovers, which means every one of the disciples, the workers, they ended up having more than enough for their own meal. John was there when Jesus had his last supper with his disciples, and he leaned up against his breast and he said, Lord, who is the one that betrays you? And he says, it's the one who dips in the cup with me. 
And as Jesus dips in the cup, Judas dips into the cup at the same time, and he looks at Judas and says, do what you must do quickly. This is John who was prompted by Peter to ask Jesus the question because Peter was down at the end of the table, uh, probably in timeout. So this John also ran to the resurrection scene of Jesus when he was coming out, when he had come out of the tomb with Peter. The book of John tells us very clearly in chapter 20 that he got there before Peter, but he didn't go in. He looked in and he believed a miracle, but Peter caught up, uh, probably a, a larger man such as myself, not known for running. He catches up and he storms in and looks around and presumes that the Romans had taken him. So this is John as an eyewitness. Later on, he was tried to be boiled in oil as one of the um, punishments for being a disciple of Jesus Christ, except he couldn't boil. It was a miraculous thing that occurred there, and there were many who came to know Christ as their Savior and came to believe in him because of it, and he was just exiled to the island of Patmos, which you might think is a terrible thing, but it's there that Jesus met him and gave him the book of Revelation that we still have to this day. So John, being an older man, is writing the book of First John. You'll notice sin mentioned 21 times very often in the church, and, and uh, Christians are very guilty of not talking about sin, thinking it's been completely done away with. And yet it's a battle that we all struggle with, whether we know the Lord or we don't know the Lord. Uh, in fact, if you know the Lord, you struggle. If you don't know the Lord, you've just given up. Jesus, as the Son of God, has said 23 times, knowing and to know these things, or you should know these things, John mentions 37 times, love, especially in chapter 5, you're going to see love is uh, brought up 46 times. What does love look like? And it's not something that's on a Hallmark card. It's something that's demonstrated in the way that you treat someone. The Holy Spirit, there's seven times contrast between light and dark. You'll see that seven times. And what it is to be born again, he uses that moniker seven times to explain to us what it looks like for a person to be born again, to have a new nature where God's done a work. You'll notice his purpose is disclosed in the book of John, which he also wrote, one of the four Gospels. He says here in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John gives us the explanation as to why he wrote the book, so that you might believe and have faith in the Son of God and that you might have life in his name. First John, he gives his definition as to one of the purposes of writing in chapter 5, verse 13. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So the purpose of the book is to edify believers and to help them to understand if they truly believe or not, and if so, what is it? What is it like for you to continue on with Jesus Christ? And so it's an encouragement. So he gives us the purpose of this book right out, right out at the end. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which is something more than just gazing. It's actually to study like you would do with a microscope. And our hands have handled concerning the word of life. John is saying that he was there as an eyewitness. He touched the body of Jesus Christ. He heard the actual words come from him. He saw him and he looked into his life. It wasn't just a casual acquaintance. And so when we get from him, we get this relationship that he had with Jesus and probably uh, the closest disciple to Jesus, probably because Jesus wanted to watch over him, make sure the other guys didn't corrupt him. But he was closest to Jesus uh, than the other disciples were. You see him at all the major times, and when they're taken aside, John is with them. In Genesis 1.1, you'll see in 1 John, he alludes to this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So right here in chapter 1 of Genesis, God is speaking and saying in the beginning, and he's talking about light and darkness. John does the very same thing in 1 John. But also the book of John, you'll also see in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word 
was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. Jesus is this word. Without him, nothing was made that has been made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He says later in verse 14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only one and begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. So he's speaking of Jesus, how he was the creator, and there was nothing that was created without him. Verse 2, And the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So John is saying, I was there, I saw this, I handled Jesus, and he's a first-person witness. So we're not getting a second-hand story, we're not getting something that was written hundreds, if not thousands of years later. This is a first-person account that John is writing, and the commentators are agreed. This was written by John the Apostle, the one who was at the feet of Jesus as he was crucified, the only disciple that stuck around. His mother was there, and he gives John the responsibility of caring for his mother. And he gives his mother the responsibility of being cared for by John because they were the only ones there. So you can read that in the scriptures. And Jesus was there. Uh, John was there while Jesus was being crucified. He was also someone who ran to the tomb and was there before Peter caught up to go in and see his resurrection. So John is a first-person account of what's happened. So he's telling us, from things he's experienced and know. And isn't it good when somebody tells you about something they've experienced and they know? It's not just hearsay. It just wasn't on the internet. It wasn't something that some uh, you know, government official said. It was actually first person. He was there. So uh, we can believe what he says because of that. That which we have seen and heard and declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. He's saying, the reason I'm telling you this is so that you might have the same faith that we do in Christ. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So the, the, the real crux of why he's writing this is so that our joy might be full in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's so that we might have fellowship with those who have gone before in their faith and also that we might have joy full. So that's, that's why he's writing this. The word for fellowship here, the fellowship with us is koinonia, which is a word, it's about having shared things together. It's about having this deep, intimate sharedness together. It's not about, uh, you know, we think fellowship is coffee and cake, but it's not. It's about having a deep, abiding fellowship. If you ever go through a difficult time with somebody, if you've ever been through 9-11 with someone, if you go through the coronavirus with someone, if you share these things together, there is a bond that comes together uh, when people share these things, and it, the Bible uses the Greek word koinonia, which is this fellowship that we have and all believers have in common. So Jesus offers to us a relationship of having oneness with him. He offers a relationship. It's not something about a religion. It's not just a set of rules and regulations to follow. It's a relationship that was purchased with his very life. So it's something that's much, much more than just an understanding of who Jesus is. It's a sharing with Jesus in who he is, which is a very different thing. It's about a relationship and not a religion. And God is the one who actually does that for us. It's not something that we do on our own. In verse 5, it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. You see the same theme in both the other books I showed. It is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So John says this very difficult thing. Because God is light and there is no darkness in him at all, there is no shadow of turning, he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Because of that, we can be assured that anyone who claims to know Jesus and yet walks around in darkness, they have a behavior, a practice, they have a lifestyle that denies him in their very ability uh, to obey the commandments, that shows that they're a liar. And I didn't say it, the scripture says it. They're a liar. They're not telling the truth because their behavior tells, 
your behavior is always going to show what you really believe. It's not what you say. It's what you do. If you want to know if someone is loving, you don't have to listen to what they say. Just watch what they do. And it's the same with being a Christian. If you truly have had an experience where your sins have been forgiven, where you've had a relationship and, and a face-to-face -face with God through Jesus Christ, your life is radically changed. And if you say that you know the God who is light and in whom there is no darkness, and yet you walk around in darkness, your lifestyle, the secret life that you lead about doing the things that your heart desires that you know are against the scripture, and yet that's your lifestyle, well then the scripture says that you lie and you don't do the truth. The truth is not in you. So what do you do with such a thing? Well, you repent and you come before God and you ask for grace and you ask for forgiveness and you ask for him to come into your life so that you might be made anew, that you believe in Jesus as the son of God, that God sent him as your sacrifice for your sin. And that's how you get to be born again, where God does work and it's not about behaving and doing right. It's about being in a relationship with God. And when we have fellowship with him, it changes the way that we live. And John is merely saying, I'm handing this off to you. That which we have received, I'm handing off to you. And we have the obligation and the privilege to be able to pick that baton up from John as we read. And I hope that you would. So he says, we have heard what we've heard and what we declare to you is that God is light. And we don't want to be those who are walking around blindly or following those who are walking around blindly. Uh, don't become a follower of any person on the face of this planet. Be a, be a follower of Jesus Christ, because that is the only way we're going to find a true path um, that, that goes for me or anyone else. And I would hope uh, everyone else who preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ would say the same. Because you don't want to walk around in darkness. You don't want to rely upon the words of somebody who may not be true. You want to depend upon what God said and about who Jesus is. That's it. So, moving on to verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship, that word koinonia again, with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us of all sin. So if we walk in the light, walking in the light is that we consider Jesus as the light in this world, and we walk in the light by following his precepts, living in his power, and growing in his grace. When we do that, we're walking in the light of his teachings, in the light of our relationship with him, and in the light of who he is. When we do that, then it says that we have fellowship with one another, we have fellowship with God with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So what we do is we walk in the footsteps of Jesus like you might follow a footprints in the snow. We walk in the footprints of Jesus, and that's how we walk in the light. We walk after his leading, and it says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It's a continual, perpetual thing that God does as he cleanses us. As we do those things that he would have us do, as we walk in a relationship of love, we walk in the light as he is in the light, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. And isn't that where you want to be? Because the Bible teaches that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all do. And we're broken from very early on. But if we walk after him, he constantly is rinsing us through and making us more like him. That is the Christian life. And that's what it is to have a relationship with God. This word that he cleanses us, it says we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us, is the word where we get catheterization from. A catheterization is not something that's enjoyable, but it's something that removes toxins and that which is harmful to the body and removes it from the body so that the body will continue to live. Uh, it's, it's not pleasant, but it's something that sometimes has to be done. And um, I've, I've had to be a part of that. I haven't had one myself, and I'm glad, but, uh, you know, I'm getting to that age, who knows. So <laughs> catheterization is about removing toxins from the body that otherwise would cause the body to be ill. That's what Jesus does for us as we pursue him and as we follow after him. He cleanses us of all unrighteousness. He gets rid of all that junk out of our lives, and, and my goodness, that's how people change, because God changes them. So, number one, he says, if we have fellowship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, this is what happens. We walk in the light, we practice the truth, we have fellowship with him, and our sins are continually washed from us. 
So that's one of the things that you can note. If you're a Christian, this is true of you. This is what we do. So, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that currently, right now, I am fixed to a place where I am just perfect. Well, most people will tell you that they're not perfect, but uh, sometimes they would lead you to believe they're almost there. The scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. A characteristic of somebody who is not a Christian is somebody that thinks they've got it all together and they don't need Jesus and they didn't do anything wrong that morally they haven't stepped over a line, that they're not guilty of anything. And that is where you know you're wrong. Uh, it's like your child that finds out what tampons are and decides that all of them need to go into the garbage or into the toilet. Or a little girl that finds a marker and thinks everything needs to be beautified. Uh, that's the way we live our lives. Or opening a jar of peanut butter and thinking that it's something to wear as opposed to uh, eat. Or that you fill up the tub with suds and, you know, if little's good, then a whole bunch is better. Uh, you know, to say that we don't do things wrong is to have a very limited and very short span of memory. Because we do things that are wrong and often we have to clean them up and it's, uh, it's sorrowful. And it's funny when kids do that. But when adults do that, they're much bigger and they're usually lifelong scars that we inflict on other people as well upon ourselves. One of the characteristics of somebody that's not a Christian is somebody that says, hey, I've got no sin. You have deceived yourself because as Jesus says, you have a log in your eye and you're busy looking at specks in everyone else's eye and everywhere you go, you're knocking people over because you've deceived yourself. It's not that you've deceived anyone. You certainly didn't deceive God, but You've deceived yourself, and we have to be careful because we have the ability to tell a lie often enough and actually believe it, which is a scary thing. So if we say that we don't have sin currently in our lives, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Because when God brings a truth to you, the first thing that you know is that you fall short and you don't deserve to be loved by God or by anyone else. That if anyone else were to know the secrets that were in your heart and the evil that you have done, they would not love you. Or at least that's the fear in our minds. And so what we do is we're not, we're not like that at all. When God speaks to a heart, the first thing he says is, you have something wrong with you, but I would like to fix it. And Jesus comes into our life to do that. If we confess our sins, which is the opposite of deceiving ourselves, if we confess our sins, the word is hom homologia, which is that, to say the same thing, to say the same word, we agree with God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us, there's that word catheterize, from all unrighteousness. So, instead of saying we have no sin, trying to cover it up, deceiving ourselves and showing ourselves not to be true believers, what we do is we confess our sins. Not only do we admit that we're sinners, but we confess them. We talk about them openly. We tell them to God and say, God, I need your forgiveness because we sin against God before anything else. Uh, David knew that in Psalm 51. I, against you and you only have I sinned. We sin against God first, and then, of course, we sin to other people, which means you learn to apologize. You learn to take responsibility for your actions, and you say, what I did was wrong. And you, you have this remorse where if you could take it back, you would, and you ask for someone to forgive you and you give them repentance and you say, I won't do that again. That's what a confession is. A confession is that you agree with God, you see from God's point of view, and you're not defending yourself or trying to lie to yourself. This is part of what it is to be a Christian. And it's not confession in a booth with a guy in a suit and, a, and, and you know, genuflecting or making motions or doing abstract, silly, uh, you know, activities because that doesn't erase your sin. Only the blood of Jesus and God himself can forgive you of your sin. So it's confession before God, but it's confession to one another. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us, to catheterize us from unrighteousness, from all unrighteousness. It also says in James chapter 5, verse 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So there's something about confessing to God to get his forgiveness and the strength to be able to overcome and repent. 
But there's something about confessing to one another and praying for one another that brings healing in our lives. When we hide our sin, it's like something in the fridge that's been there way too long. It just proliferates. But it's when we open it up to the light and we disclose it to God that the devil loses all of his power. The secrecy is gone and it's suddenly exposed to the light and it begins to die. And you pray for one another that you may be healed. And it says that the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So what we do is we confess, we forgive, we disclose the secrets of our heart and our secret lives, and God constantly is cleansing us. So it's not just something we do towards God, it's something in, in the fellowship of believers we do towards one another. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, another word, confess, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, confession is the beginning of salvation. It's confessing before God that you believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the son of the living God, that God sent him and he was the propitiation or the, the, the substitute for you, that he took your sins away. That's what Christianity is about. It's not about anything else. It's about that. So, it's about the Lord. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He died and took our place and our punishment so that we could live a righteous life like he lived. It wasn't just to save us from hell. It was to save us to be like him, that we might be conformed to his image and we might look more like him all the time. So, Ever feel like you've got a burden that you can't handle that's taking you away? Maybe it's worry. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's anxiety. Well, it's something that will begin to run you and overwhelm you. And Jesus doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to confess and get that stuff off of our heart because in truth, people carry things much longer and much bigger than they were ever destined to carry. And when we unload that stuff and we give it to the Lord, he can handle it, but we can't. What it'll do is it'll turn us upended. So, so what you need is the forgive all. Forgiveness is one of those things that we get from God because we confess, not because we earn it or we do a hundred good things to offset that really bad thing that we did. Forgiveness is something that God just gives to us through Jesus Christ. And if you have a relationship with him and if you know him as your Lord and Savior, you have that forgiveness. So don't ever forget that or let anybody tell you that you have to bear your own sins because we're not designed to do that. It will cause immeasurable destructive force in our minds and our hearts and our bodies. So that's why Jesus came. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus telling a parable of two folks that went into a temple and he says in verse 10, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a religious ruler, and the other a tax collector. Um, tax collectors weren't favored then either. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus then says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we see the principle that when we pat ourselves on the back, when we're all about promoting ourselves and we're not about confessing and about being humble and about being honest about our flaws, that we're not justified before God because we haven't been honest. We haven't opened up and told him the truth. We haven't agreed. That's confession. I haven't agreed with what God has said. But when we do, we look like him. Um, Spurgeon says this, treat God truthfully and he will treat you truthfully. Make no pretensions before God, but lay bare your soul. Let him see it as it is, and then he will be faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
So for, for us to be open and honest, we're going to be open and honest with God, and then he's open and honest with us, and he's forgiving. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But if we're going to be fake and go to God and pretend, you know, that, you know, we're the best thing since sliced bread or it's a good thing God's got you on his team, that doesn't go with God. What he does is he accepts a humble and contrite heart and he will never despise somebody who comes to him like that. So the second thing that we do when we have fellowship with God is we do not claim practical perfection. In other words, in my life, I don't live a perfect life. I, I don't even have the equipment to be able to do that. And so be dishonest but process the truth by confessing our sin to obtain absolution, forgiveness, and perpetual cleansing. That's what a Christian does. That's part of the Christian life. Just like it is for us to walk in the light and practice the truth and have fellowship with one another, what happens is we're going to confess. We're going to be open and honest with one another. So that's our relationship with God, and that's our relationship with other people. So, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. That's very strong words. But if you say that, hey, I haven't done anything wrong morally, I haven't stepped over any lines, I haven't broken any laws, and after all, nobody was really hurt, um, you know, and I'm not really a bad person, I'm really a good person at heart, you, you begin to say things like that, you're saying that you haven't sinned. You're saying that it's never happened. Not that it's part of your life now, that it's a practice, but that you've never done it whatsoever. There are people that will say that. I'm a good person. Well, do good people murder people in their thoughts? Of course they don't. But you know, Jesus says, if you think about murder, if you think and you're angry at your brother, it says it's just like you murdered him. Or if you look at a woman and you desire her in your heart, not, not anything other than just desire. It's just like you've committed adultery. It's just like you've raped her. If you look at her with desire, Jesus says, so if that's the case, then all of us have sinned. And to say that I haven't sinned or that I can do all of these things that I do and it's not sin, you don't know who Jesus is. Because the very first thing that you're going to know is that you are badly maligned from birth. So that's what we know. And that's, that's imperative. It's hugely important. So the third thing in 1 John 1.10, he says, we confess to being born in sin and marred by sin in our thoughts and our actions, our first breath until now. So what we do is we understand that we need a Savior, that we are broken, beyond our ability to self-help or fix ourselves. And only God has the tools and the ability to fix us from the inside. We could try to modify our behavior. We could try to change the people that we spend time with. We could try to change our behavior, we can try to read the Bible more, even come to church, you know, punch a card, warm a seat. We can do all of those things and good deeds towards others and giving, and, but that doesn't undo all of the wicked things that we've done. What does is when we come before God honestly and say, I have done wrong by you and I deserve punishment eternally because of what I've done. But I accept Jesus Christ and I believe in his free gift that he sent for me. And by believing in him, I have life in his name. That's what the scripture says. And so that's what I do. And that makes all the difference in my life. And that's what changes me. So there are three things that you can check and to see if you're really walking in the truth. Number one, if you're walking in the light, practicing those things that are of the truth. Number two, if you, if you claim that you're perfect and, and you're not in sin, that there isn't some active thing in your life that you're not battling, if you can say that, well, then you're a liar. And number three, if you say that you've never done anything wrong, and that you're a good person. If you truly believe that, then you don't know Jesus Christ because there are none who are good. No, not one. There's none who seek God. There's none, it says in Isaiah. So that's what Christians believe, and that's how we behave. As far as next week's concerned, this is what it'll look like. In chapter 2, my little children, John, begins these things I write to you so that you may not sin. So if you don't want to sin, good book to read. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation or the provision for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 
The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross because he was perfect and God incarnate, his one sacrifice was good for all of the sin of all the world of everyone that's ever lived. It's enough for us to believe in him because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we'll talk about that next week. I just want to leave you with a little bit of encouragement before I go. In Psalm 121, this is a song of ascents, and it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence my, comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So in a time when you might be worried and concerned about the future and about how everything is happening, know that God is not asleep. He's not asleep at the switch. He knows exactly what's happening and he has a plan for your life. And I pray that God might bless you as you put these things into practice and do what he's asked you to do, that God will show you his blessing and his righteous right hand will be upon you. May God bless you. Amen.